What a fantastic but frenzied time of year. Seedlings and young plants in every corner of our home, capturing as much available light as possible to maximize that head start. On top of that, a lot of important tips and tricks covered over the last month, probably more so than any other time of the year. Not to put any more pressure on it, but what we do right now could very well dictate our level of success come harvest time. So, in case you missed it, here's volume 13 of the Garden Quickie, episodes 121 to 130. Enjoy. Lettuce is one of the most popular backyard garden crops, and for good reason. Relatively easy to grow, cold tolerant to a degree, and skyrocketing prices lately, coupled with frequent safety recalls, means growing lettuce in our backyards is more popular than ever. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, hopefully we're more popular than ever. And today's episode is all about lettuce. More specifically, the four different kinds of lettuce that you can grow in your own backyard. Time short as it always is, so let's get into it. Lettuce, or Lactusa sativa, is an annual plant in the same family as dandelions and, amazingly, sunflowers. Over 56% of the world's annual lettuce supply is actually grown in China. And amid recent safety scares, as well as insane grocery store prices, many of us have decided to grow our own. For us lettuce connoisseurs, we have four types to choose from. The most popular type of lettuce to buy in North America, not necessarily to grow, is iceberg or head lettuce. Heat sensitive, prone to bugs, and low in nutrients as well as flavor, I don't really grow much iceberg lettuce these days. But it ships well and it keeps for a long time on the shelf telling you where it gets its popularity from. Our second type of lettuce to grow is leaf lettuce. Also known as curly or loose leaf, this lettuce is great for salads, garnish, as well as sandwiches and even burgers. Plus, if you get bored with the green varieties, give the red and purple ones a try. They're delicious. Our third type of lettuce is known as the butterhead or butter crunch variety. And in the UK, it's known as round lettuce. You know, I find these guys to be a combination of the loose leaf and the iceberg kinds. Sweet, tender, rounded leaves arranged loosely in concentric circles. Butterhead has yet to reach the popularity of the other kinds, but I think it's catching up. And finally, we have my personal favorite and the one I grow the most of, and that's your romaine or cause types of lettuce. Used almost exclusively as a salad green, romaine types tend to grow upright, sometimes even over a foot tall, and they perform well in a variety of conditions as well as climates. If you ever wanted to dip your toes into the world of homegrown lettuce, the romaine types certainly won't leave you disappointed. Hey, you know what else won't leave you disappointed? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Easy to grow, quick, highly nutritious crops that are bursting with raw, crisp flavor. The only problem is which one to choose. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll never make you choose. And today's episode is all about sprouts versus microgreens. Or more specifically, what the heck is the difference between the two? Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's get into it. When microgreens first came out, or at least when the term first became popular, many people questioned whether it was just a fancy new name for sprouts. The answer is no, of course it's not. These are two very different products. In simple terms, sprouts and microgreens refer to specific stages in a plant's life cycle. It goes deeper than that though, as sprouts and microgreens are grown differently, they taste different, and they have completely different end products. Let me explain. 
Sprouts are the just germinated seeds of specific plants grown only in water. They are never potted or planted up and they're ready for harvest in about a week or even less. On the flip side, microgreens are planted in soil immediately after the initial soaking period and they're allowed to grow up even getting to the true leaf stage. So while your sprouts like these mung beans here are going to go from dry seed to harvest in a week, sometimes even less, Microgreens, such as this daikon radish, are going to go past that sprout stage for at least another week to 10 days. On top of that, sprouts are eaten whole. That means the roots, shoots, and sometimes even the seed coat. Microgreens, on the other hand, well, they're grown purely for the shoots. And because of this, in addition to requiring soil and being potted or planted up, they need access to light, real or artificial, to fully grow properly. Two crop types that share a near identical initial 24 hours right off the bat, only to diverge into two very awesome outcomes. Know what else is going to have an awesome outcome? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Tucked away since fall, the longest crop we grow is often forgot about, not expected to be seen until springtime. But if gardening has taught us anything, it's that the unpredictable is completely predictable. And this is occasionally, sometimes often true with our hard neck garlic. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, being unpredictable is our specialty. And today's episode is all about garlic. More specifically, our garlic that has sprouted early. Why does it do it, and is it going to be okay? Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. All hardneck garlic is planted in the fall, overwintered in the ground in a semi-dormant state, sprung to life in the spring, and harvested the following summer. It's a tried and true life cycle that's completely necessary to get these properly formed bulbs. So why then does our garlic sprout in the middle of winter sometimes? Well, to answer that, let's dig up one of these bulbs and see why that is. Garlic cloves, which develop into the bulbs we harvest after a long 9 to 10 months, are never truly dormant. Even without the shoots, massive root systems are already being built underground. But if we add in some extra moisture and a couple of warm days, voila, we get shoots early. It's no big deal, and in fact, if you live in zones 8 or warmer, quite likely it's the norm rather than not. Although your garlic will most likely be fine, there is one inherent danger for them to be sprouting early. And surprisingly, it's not that the shoots freeze. That's fine. That doesn't really affect them. The main issue with garlic sprouting too early is that water can wick down the new shoot and in extreme cases, rot out the bulb below. No mulch and poor drainage are the biggest contributors to this. So, keep your garlic clear of excess moisture and draining freely all winter and you'll be problem free. Know what else is problem free? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Long, tall and thin. It's what we all want, right? Actually, no, not in our plants and especially not in our seedlings. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we like you just the way you are. But like all Garden Quickies, it's not about us. It's about the plants. And today specifically, seedlings. Tall and weak seedlings are a common problem every year. Don't stress though, I got three ways to fix it, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. First and foremost, our young plants reach and stretch for the light from the moment they sprout. The determination is admirable, but the outcome is not always desired. Long leggy seedlings are often weak, top heavy, prone to bending or even breaking, and generally underperform their stocky counterparts. Okay, so how do we prevent this? Well, seedlings become long and leggy almost always as a response to insufficient light. Either the wrong wavelength, not enough intensity, 
or both. So, right from the start, day one of germination, ensure 12 to 16 hours of good quality full spectrum light per day. Although there's no substitute for the right light, there are a couple other things that we can do to prevent long leggy seedlings. And the first of those is air circulation. When plants are outside, no matter what their ages are, they're constantly being bombarded by air motion, even on completely calm days. And it's this air motion that triggers the plants to grow more roots for anchoring and thicker, stronger stems for support. Inside, it's an easy fix and a simple oscillating fan on low for a few hours a day is enough to accomplish the desired effect. And finally, the third way to prevent extreme legginess in our seedlings is to decrease the temperatures as soon as possible. Likely, we've had the heat jacked for germination, as most seeds sprout best above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in just two to three days after germination, we can crank down the heat and slow down the long tissue growth of the stems, allowing the extra light and the air motion to work their magic. Know what else will allow you to work your magic? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. No question, it's a lot of work sometimes just to get ahead in life. As is the case with gardening and sowing our seeds early. Mixing, filling, watering, and planting. It all adds up, and although we thoroughly enjoy it, it still kind of stings when it doesn't go perfectly. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, perfection is not required. But we do want the work to be worth it, and starting our seeds early indoors is done with a purpose. We do it to get that much needed head start and to extend the growing season when maybe ours is a bit too short. And in those efforts to get ahead, our seedlings often grow too long, too tall, too fast. I got three things we can do to fix long and leggy seedlings, even if it's already happened. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. As with anything, prevention is the best medicine. I'm talking about cooler temperatures, more air circulation, and higher light intensity. Great preventative measures, as we saw in this video right here, but they can also be used after the fact to rectify leggy seedlings. If your young plants have grown up too tall and too floppy, Correct these three parameters first. Next, once we correct the environment, let's get to work on the seedlings themselves. For branching varieties like basil, mint, and even tomatoes and peppers, we can top prune them, causing the young plants to branch out, becoming more bushier. And for plants where you've multi-seeded them, now is the time to thin them out. Trim away all but the strongest specimen to allow more airflow, and less reliance on the neighbors for support. Those two things combined are gonna strengthen up those stems in no time. Lastly, and this only works for certain varieties, but we can replant the seedlings completely, only this time a lot deeper. For leggy seedlings like this Roma tomato here, we can actually bury the entire stem. Bury that stem as deep as you like, right up to that first whirl of leaves, transforming a telephone pole-like specimen to a short, stout, perfect little bush. There you go, guys. Three ways to regain control of your starter plants and get your early garden back on track. Know what else is going to get your garden back on track? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Feeding our seedlings is often a contentious topic, with many opinions, suggestions, and rules. For the new grower, that's not really fair, nor is it very helpful, and getting a clear-cut answer on when we should start feeding our seedlings isn't always easy. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, easy is our middle name. And today's episode is all about fertilizing our seedlings. The what, when, and why, all explained. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Seeds by design are amazing. Astonishing dormant vessels of life that support and sustain our young plants. 
and they do this for a lot longer than people think. When our seedlings first sprout and poke themselves out of the soil, they're actually still being supported nutritionally by the seed. And this early embryonic dance lasts for about one to two weeks. There is some variance on this, with each variety of plant kind of operating on its own timeline. As well, it can be affected by temperature. Great, so when can we feed? Well, rather than there being some sort of predetermined timeline, it's the plants themselves that tell us when they're ready. When a young plant first sprouts, and it's still feeding off the remnants of the seed, it does so with two odd-shaped leaves. These are known as cotyledons, or seed leaves. Within a period of about a week, sometimes two, right from the center of those cotyledons, the true leaves begin to appear. It's these leaves that are ready for true photosynthesis. And like a baby chick leaving the nest, the plant is going to begin feeding to support itself. Like we said, all this happens about one to two weeks after germination, around two to four weeks after you initially planted the seeds. It's at this point right now that we can start feeding our seedlings using a dilute organic liquid feed from below for the best results. The shoots are actively photosynthesizing and the roots are diligently taking up water and water soluble nutrients to facilitate it. From here, right up until planting in the garden, a weekly schedule is commonly suggested. One more pro tip though, is that most seeding soils are devoid of nutrients. But not all of them. If your store-bought seeding soil has boosters, enhancers, or some other advertised additive, you can skip the first two feedings at least until the plant has used up all the available nutrients. One thing not to skip though is the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Right now my fellow gardeners around the world are starting all their seeds early indoors to get a jump on the season. Every variety of vegetable seed imaginable sprouting right now under the glare of a million grow lights. But have you guys ever noticed that when our crops do sprout, they do so with two funny looking leaves that resemble nothing like the adult plant? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, being funny looking is almost a prerequisite. And today's episode is all about cotyledons, or seed leaves. What the heck are they, and what are they all about? Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Cotyledons were first described by science way back in the 1600s, and they're essentially embryonic leaves contained within the seed of our favorite crops. When a seed sprouts, they're the first appendages to appear above the ground, and contrary to what many think, they actually can photosynthesize. In the world of flowering plants, which includes most of our crops, you'll also be interested to know that they're first classified based on the number of cotyledons they have. All true flowering plants are first divided into those with one cotyledon, monocots, and those with two cotyledons, or dicots. The vast majority of the crops we grow are those with two cotyledons, dicots, but did you know that we grow some pretty important monocots as well? For starters, how about corn, rice, wheat, sugarcane, ginger, turmeric, asparagus, pineapple, and all the alliums including leeks, onions, green onions, and of course this garlic. Pretty amazing stuff, eh? While they may fall off pretty early in some plants, in others, they can endure and actually contribute to the overall plant's growth for weeks or even sometimes months. Either way, they may signal the start of a plant's life initially, but these modified leaves do so much more. Much like watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie will do for you. Built to capture the energy of the sun, the green leaves of our favorite tomato varieties are nothing short of amazing. But what happens when those leaves turn another color, say purple, seemingly overnight? What could have possibly caused this and are the plants still viable? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, viability is our priority. And today's episode is all about tomato leaves. 
More specifically, purple tomato leaves. Why do they occur? Are they bad? And if so, can the plants be saved? Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Tomatoes are red and the leaves are green. Well, for the most part. So why is it that sometimes early in development, our tomato leaves turn purple? Well, there's actually three main reasons. And the first, most common reason is a simple nutrient deficiency. Young tomato leaves will quickly turn purple in the absence of the right amount of one or more nutrients, usually potassium and phosphorus. A diligent but moderate feeding regimen of a liquid low-dose organic solution can rectify the problem in as little as a week. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to determine exactly which nutrient is deficient, so I find a broad-spectrum solution is your best bet. The second reason your tomato leaves are going to turn purple is temperature. If it's too cold, your tomato plants won't function properly. Specifically, if the soil isn't warm enough, the roots can't properly absorb the nutrients it needs for basic functioning. Again, this is going to cause that nutrient deficiency, and again, turning the leaves purple. Lastly, and I hope this isn't the case, but your tomato leaves may turn purple because of a virus. Viral infections carried by pests such as thrips can definitely turn your leaves purple or even black. If this is the case, sometimes the only solution is to remove the infected plants. Not good. Now, one way to tell a viral infection from a simple nutrient deficiency is how the leaves change color. If the leaves of your tomato plants turn purple on the undersides or the veins first, well you can breathe a sigh of relief as most likely it's just a nutrient deficiency, making the solution much, much easier. Know what else is much easier? Choosing to subscribe and watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Having a greenhouse to work in on a day like today is no doubt a luxury. And no matter what my task is, it's always made better by being in the comfy confines of my favorite place to be. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show we're in two minutes or less. Hopefully, it's one of your favorite places to be. However, just because having a large greenhouse is a luxury doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to extract the maximum benefit from it. Layout, design, shelving, lighting, and other amenities are nice, but you won't get the full value from your setup unless the orientation is right. And today's episode is all about proper greenhouse orientation. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. The established standard in the industry is to have your greenhouse running from east to west. This way, the sun rises and runs the entire length of your structure over the course of a day. Situated north-south in the northern hemisphere, the north side of your greenhouse will be shaded out for much of the day, and vice versa for the north-south greenhouses in the southern hemisphere. So by running the long side of your greenhouse east-west, you're going to maximize that light input for the entire day. Now, I do admit, light is but one factor whenever you're choosing a greenhouse's orientation as well as its location. But, east-west does maximize a plant's greatest need, which is its ability to capture light. Unless dire, I feel that supersedes all other factors, making it an easy choice. A choice almost as easy as subscribing and watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. The single most popular backyard crop. Tomatoes. Every year, like clockwork, millions are started early indoors during the winter or purchased as small plants in the spring. And as much as I love a fresh tomato from the garden, I firmly believe that this crop is so popular because of its ability to transplant so well. In fact, this is one plant that actually thrives on it. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we thrive only because of you.
And today's episode is all about transplanting your tomato seedlings. More specifically, when do we do it? What's considered too early and what's too late? When is that ideal time? Time that is in short supply as it always is. So let's dive in. The window of planting a tomato seed to its germination is about a week. It is temperature dependent and this can vary slightly. When those seeds first sprout, as we've learned from previous videos, they do so with two odd looking seed leaves known as cotyledons. The roots are very underdeveloped at this point, so we let them grow. Within about a week later, under optimal conditions, a set of true leaves is going to form in the center, more resembling that familiar tomato leaf shape. Growth appears to be a bit slow here, and I know you guys are getting impatient. For some varieties, it can be a full two weeks or more until we get a second set of true leaves. In reality though, the growth isn't slow at all. It may appear so above ground, but below ground, the roots are going crazy. This is good because this is exactly what we want to see for transplanting. It's when the second set of true leaves fully appear that we can start thinking about moving these plants on. Time-wise, if you're keeping track, that's about a month since we first put the seeds in the soil. More accurately though, you really want the plant's development to dictate the timeline. You really want to wait until you see that second set of true leaves fully develop. That's the key. Look, there's a million right ways to grow your tomatoes. And in large enough pots, or even paper cups, you might not even need to transplant them. Fortunately though, for a lot of us growers, tomatoes love it. And actually, they thrive the more often we replant them. No wonder they're so popular. Almost as popular as watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.